Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to look at spiritualist mediumship as a source of evidence for survival of the human personality after bodily death. With me is Dr. Stephen Browdy, an emeritus professor of philosophy and former chairman of the philosophy department at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He is the author of numerous books on parapsychology, including Immortal Remains, The Limits of Influence, The Gold Leaf Lady, and Crimes of Reason. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you, Jeff. Good to be with you again. Good to be with you, too. I, I suppose if we look at all the different kinds of evidence that point toward human survival, the most uh, persistent and consistent, uh, for what it's worth, comes from spiritualist mediums. Certainly one of the two big ones. I'd say the other would be reincarnation, mm -hmm. which is more robust, I don't know, but certainly there are a lot of cases of mediumship and it's been going on since uh, antiquity. Many people uh, today don't realize what an enormous fad spiritualism was in the 19th century. Well, there was no TV. It was better than uh, uh, just sitting around. Mm -hmm. And, and people uh, would go to seances uh, for entertainment and uh, perhaps even enlightenment. Well, certainly there were, in many cases, urgent personal reasons that drove them to mediumship, but there was a flowering of mediumship in the uh, mid-19th century and which continues to this day. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we look at the evidence that comes uh, from the best of cases, uh, even that, as, as you pointed out in our previous interview uh, concerning the philosophical issues, even the best of cases contain what you called, as, as I recall, twaddle. <laughs> twaddle, but also a great deal of ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Ambiguity that makes it very difficult to decide if we're really dealing with post-mortem communications or whether we're dealing with really good psychic functioning among the living. Mm -hmm. But I know that there have been uh, researchers in the field of parapsychology and psychical research who devoted their lives to trying to at least come up with a personal answer for them based on empirical evidence as to whether survival uh, occurred and actually uh, the results have been mixed. Not every researcher agrees uh, that survival is real. My own approach has been to think that the um, major question we should be asking when we look at cases of ostensible mediumship is whose interests um, would be satisfied by the appearance of uh, evidence suggesting survival, mm. the interests of the deceased or the interests of the living. Mm. I think in both cases we need to look at who has the most to gain. If the case suggests that um, the only really impressive motives would be those of the deceased, then we've got something that might tilt the scales in that direction. If it looks like there's really persistent interest among the living mm -hmm. to simulate the evidence of, of survival, yeah. we need to take that seriously. Well, and, and there are probably motives on both sides, but it would seem to me that uh, from a scientific point of view uh, and a philosophical point of view, the, the motive on either side is to get at the truth. Well, what I had in mind is the reason why some people like what are often called drop-in mm -hmm. cases of mediumship. Yes. So perhaps I should say something. Let's about define that. that to begin with. A drop it. You know, people go to a séance usually to communicate with deceased friends and relatives, mm. but occasionally communicators come through the medium uninvited. They just drop in, mm -hmm. and in the best of the drop-in cases, the drop-in communicator is unknown to anybody present at the séance. And in a convincing drop-in case, this would be one where the communicator provides verifiable information known to no one at the seance or known, mm -hmm. ideally, to no living person. Yeah. Um, and again, a good drop-in case would be one where the answer to the question, whose needs would be satisfied by the appearance of evidence suggesting survival, would be a clear uh, answer in favor of the deceased rather than the living. 
And there's a classic case of that sort from Iceland that I know you've written about. This is the case of Runke's leg. Yeah. It's hard to give a, a quick synopsis of that, but let me try. The medium in this case was arguably Iceland's greatest mental medium, Hafstein Bjornsson, um, whose career was at the early part of the 20th century. Hafstein worked as a, in a radio station. That was his day job. He did earn some money as um, a medium. And he was particularly well known for giving lots of detailed, accurate information about places and dates of the deceased. Mm -hmm. And one day at a seance with Hafstein, a drop-in appeared, and they asked what his name is. And he gave what would be the Icelandic equivalent of a fictitious or phony name, mm -hmm. the equivalent of John Smith, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. They said, well, what do you want? And he said, I want my leg. He said, and he said his leg was in the sea. And they kept trying to get information from the sitter and uh, from the communicator, and the communicator uh, refused to actually cough up anything more detailed. He just kept demanding his leg. Right. And the medium, who was a trance medium, kept exhibiting behaviors that were quite uncharacteristic, like demanding alcohol, um, going through the motions of using snuff, n neither of which the medium did. Mm -hmm. And this went on for quite a few months. And then the seance moved to a new location and a new personnel. And one of them was a guy named Ludwig Goodmanson. And the drop-in continued to appear, just giving his name and saying he wanted his leg, but surprising everybody by saying he was glad that Ludwig was there because his leg, he now said, was uh, in Ludwig's house in a nearby town of San Gerdi. Mm -hmm. Well, this came as news to Ludwig. Yeah. And uh, Ludwig asked for more information, and the communicator refused to do it. And finally, Ludwig and everybody got fed up with the communicator and gave an ultimatum. He said, we'll help you find your leg. You give us some information. Mm -hmm. The communicator then disappeared for a period of months. And when he came back, he told a story about himself, about how he had been drinking uh, heavily and went to a party on the, while walking home to his farm stopped at another place for more to drink, mm -hmm. and finally decided to head off home in the middle of a rainstorm. The people at the party wanted him to have a designated walker, but he said, no, thank you. Yeah. And they were apparently happy to see him go. And so um, he said his name was Runke Runolfson, or Runolfa Runolfson, a.k.a. Runke. Mm -hmm. And so Runke was heading off home to his farm. At one point in the middle of the rainstorm, he sat down on a rock to rest, and for a drink from the flask that he carried with him. He fell asleep on the rock, and the tide came in and washed him out to sea, mm -hmm. where he drowned. Mm -hmm. His body was washed ashore. Uh, dogs and ravens tore the body to pieces, he said. And all his bones were recovered except for a leg bone, a femur, mm -hmm. which he said was now in Ludwig's house. And Runke said, you can confirm all this by going to the church book at Utskalar. So people looked at the church book in Utskalar. They found some of the details that the communicator had given about himself. Mm -hmm. They found more in another book written by uh, the same author, but unpublished and was in the National Archives. It mm -hmm. gave, more, gave more details. And they located Runke's grandson, who confirmed that Runke was tall. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting about the case is, first of all, that Information about the deceased Runke came from a number of obscure sources, none of which presumably were known to the sitters at the seance. And if you ask whose needs would be most satisfied by the uh, discovery of the leg and so on, the answer seems to be a clear Runke. Mm -hmm. Now, there's more to the story. So Ludwig now had to keep his part of the bargain. He went back to San Gerardi and asked if anybody knew about this leg. And some of the older residents said, well, a while ago, a leg had been going around. <laughs> and they said it was, um, they remembered that, somebody said he remembered seeing somebody place it in the wall of Ludwig's house. Yeah. He took that person to the appropriate place in the wall. They tore down the wall, and they found a femur belonging to a tall person. Mm -hmm. They were never able to confirm that it was Runke's. Uh, they could never confirm where Runke's grave was. The problem is that in Utskalar, uh, the graves are unmarked and some are stacked on top of yeah. one another. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the fact that they found a femur at all inside the walls of the house is quite remarkable. It is, and one belonging to a tall person. Yeah. 
And this has a happy ending because uh, Ludwig built a little coffin for the femur. Um, uh, they had a, had a church service, a memorial service, mm -hmm. the choir sang, they served tea and cakes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Runke said later at a seance that uh, he had attended, you know, attended. And he was satisfied with uh, the way things went. And then instead of being an annoying drop-in, he became a helpful, he mellowed out and became a helpful communicator. Mm -hmm. So the, com the communicator's behavior conformed to what we might expect of a deceased person if he really did have this mm -hmm. agenda to get mm -hmm. things settled about his bone. So you regard this as a strong case. There are some problematic aspects to the case, if I may self-servingly recommend reading Immortal Remains for my mm -hmm. discussion of it. Yeah. Um, there are some nagging concerns about the quality of the evidence, but it illustrates why a, a good drop-in case could be uh, more convincing than some other types of mediumship mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when looking for evidence. And, and the reason, once again, is that it has to do with the needs of the drop-in communicator. To deal with some unfinished business, whether mm -hmm. it's um, helping out a family member, whether it's settling uh, unse unsettled scores or mm -hmm. something like that. Well, it's interesting also that in, in this particular instance, the communicator, Runke, felt that uh, the recovery of the femur uh, was important. Well, yeah, some people might wonder why so much uh, attention would be paid to individual bones. Yeah. I'm assured by Erlander Haraldson and other Icelanders I know that uh, that's actually not a peculiar uh, thing for mm -hmm. an Icelander. It might be cultural. In yes, other words. indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, that it would be disrespectful not to uh, properly bury the bones of a deceased. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, an example of, uh, from a drop-in yes. communicator, but most uh, mediumistic communications don't involve drop-ins. No. Um, the most impressive cases would be those where people uh, want to communicate with deceased relatives or friends, and they get very detailed, intimate um, evidence that the uh, communicator is who he or she claims to be. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in the famous case of the American medium Leonora Piper, uh, Mrs. Piper was very famous for being able to come up with uh, details time after time uh, between the same communicator, for example, and lots of people who knew that communicator, uh, mm -hmm. that communicator when he or she was alive. Mm -hmm. The most famous example would be the GP personality, George Pelu. Mm -hmm. um, I think. 150 people communicated with the GP communicator. 30 of them knew GP well during his life. Of those 30 people who interviewed the GP communicator, he correctly identified 29 of them. The only one he missed was someone who the last time he saw when alive was a little girl, but at this time when she communicated mm -hmm. with him, she was an adult. In, in other words, these people are typically are called sitters, sitters. who attend the seance, Correct. and uh, in the best of circumstances, they are anonymous. They're, the medium is never introduced to uh, them by name. Right. Uh, the medium didn't know who they were. Um, the sitters all felt that they were really in touch with someone who could uh, communicate with them about things that would have been known only to the two of them. Mm -hmm. um, I should add that Mrs. Piper was scrupulously examined. She was trailed by detectives uh, sent by the members of the Society for Psychical Research. To see that she wasn't on the sly researching uh, this sort of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And her career went on for many, many years mm -hmm. providing evidence of this quality. Well, an interesting thing about Mrs. Piper, uh, <coughs> who worked with William James ex right. extensively, yeah, and that's probably why she became so famous, uh, she was also tested by uh, another famous American psychologist, Stanley Hall. And uh, to my recollection, uh, he, he claimed that she provided no evidence whatsoever. I f forget the details of that experiment right now, but yeah. I do remember that she was treated very poorly. Mm -hmm. And it was transformative for her mediumship because after that she didn't do quite as well as uh, afterwards. So, yeah. and, you know, mediums need to be handled with the same sort of respect and caution as every experimental subject. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm under the impression that Stanley Hall was skeptical uh, yes. from the very beginning, although yes. I, I did read the book, 
and, and he uh, at least went so far as to commend Mrs. Piper for her willingness to cooperate with him over an extended period of time. Yes, no one had any doubts about Mrs. Piper's character. Mm -hmm. Um, some had doubts about her mediumship, and even William James wasn't sure that she provided evidence of survival. He was in no doubt whatsoever that uh, she exhibited some sort of, he called it, supernormal faculty. Yes. Well, I, I gather that there were moments when he felt pretty impressed that from a dramatic point of view, I think as he expressed it, uh, it was convincing, if not scientifically convincing. Absolutely, yes. It had that kind of visceral uh, quality which the very best cases, in fact, usually have. Mm -hmm. So as a, a philosopher looking at mediumship, I guess uh, you're in a position where you can say you know, some of that evidence is really, really strong and a lot of it uh, uh, is susceptible to other non-survivalist explanations. Well, as I indicated in our previous interview, I find it very hard to uh, decide whether the balance tips more in favor of survival or more in favor of living age and sigh. Mm -hmm. um, it's really hard to know. What impresses me about Mrs. Piper's case is that it went on for as long as it did. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the hardest thing for the living age and sigh hypothesis to explain. Um, there's a problem which I don't think we can adequately get into here. I call it the problem of crippling complexity yeah. of positing super psi or living agent psi mm -hmm. explanations. To some extent, the more super we allow living agent psi to be, yeah. the more it tends to undermine itself as an explanation. It does, in fact, seem somewhat more parsimonious to suppose that the medium has just got a direct line to the deceased. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in the previous interview, we talked about the famous case of the chess game from mm -hmm. the dead. And that's a case <laughs> that involved a lot of information, obscure information about a deceased chess player, but also the deceased chess player played a game of chess with a living grandmaster right. and, uh, and played at, at chess master level way beyond the ability of the medium. Well, this is one of the reasons why, one of the philosophical preliminaries to doing any decent exploration of the evidence for survival is to get clear about what human abilities are, yeah. which is something I don't think psychologists are even clear about. Mm -hmm. um, and also why we need to take particular care to pay attention to what savants and prodigies are able to do. Mm -hmm. We need to consider just how easy it is to manifest certain kinds of abilities without practice. We know that the very best prodigies and mediums, uh, prodigies and savants, sorry, yeah. um, are able to exhibit extraordinary abilities, arguably better than what we see in any survival case, um, without having to practice them ahead of time. Mean like Mozart composing music and, and playing right. music as a four-year-old child. Or Gauss's mathematical ability, which emerged very early on. Mm -hmm. So the fact is we know so little about savants and prodigies we don't understand how savants can exhibit their phenomenal abilities even in the presence of physical or psychological deficits which you think would count against them yeah so since we don't understand those i think we need to be very wary about supposing that mediums couldn't have latent abilities of one kind or another which can be brought out under unusual psychological states or dissociative states we don't know. Well, I think when we look at human ability, there, there are two issues. One is talent. Is, is there a basic talent there? And the other is what kind of training is required to bring out that talent? Well, we do know about prodigies, for example, mm -hmm. that uh, if Mozart's ability hadn't been cultivated, it wouldn't have reached the exquisite form that it took later in his career. Yeah. But the fact is, Mozart was able to do phenomenal things before the ability was refined. Mm -hmm. And so our concern is whether there is evidence in survival cases yeah. of ability that's more akin to Mozart's refined later ability or something more mm -hmm. uh, akin to what he showed early in life. So in the case of the... Um automatic writing medium who was uh, able to demonstrate chess abilities at, at the chess master level, uh, the question is w whether that could have been, uh, that ability could have been acquired through some sort of uh, normal means. Um, yes, um, in terms of one of the unusual suspects, as mm -hmm. I put it in the previous interview. Yeah. And like I think the medium was unconsciously a chess savant. 
something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to rule out. I don't want to say that we can dispense with the, um, it, the all the impressive features of the chess uh, case. Right. And, but we do know that there are instances of talents that only come out in an altered state of consciousness. Yes. So that if a medium in trance expresses a, a rare talent, but they can't do it in their normal waking state, that doesn't necessarily argue in favor of survival. Absolutely correct. And that's why I think we need to um, take a, a very cautious approach to looking at these cases. Mm -hmm. That there's, in other words, in, in your opinion, no need to jump to a, a conclusion. As many people would like us to say, after 150 years, aren't you prepared to say that the evidence for survival is incontrovertible? Yeah, I think some people do it much too easily. Yeah. We need to get clear on what abilities are, how easy it is to generalize across abilities. Mm -hmm. um, whether learning to ride a bike uh, is something that has the same characteristics as learning to write music, yeah. and so on. Mm -hmm. Another famous medium is Pearl Curran yes. uh, of uh, St. Louis, who is known uh, under the pen name of Patience Worth. She wrote a lot of great literature. Many people believe that she stands as evidence of survival. Um, yes, that's an absolutely terrible inference from the case. Uh, Pearl Curran was a St. Louis housewife who, in 1913, began channeling um, through a Ouija board initially. Uh, communications from a 17th century English woman calling herself Patience Worth. Um, she wrote in a very archaic uh, Anglo-Saxon dialect, uh, not apparently like any that had ever been spoken. She exhibited unprecedented literary abilities. I believe a, some literary magazines uh, lauded the work. Um, high praise for her novels and her plays and mm -hmm. her poetry. Her poetry is often really very exquisite. Mm -hmm. um, she could exhibit various kinds of stunts of composition. Um, on one occasion, she was asked to improvise a poem, each line of which would begin with a different letter of the alphabet going from A to Z. Mm -hmm. And out it came as quickly as the scribe could take it down. It wasn't her best poem, but to yeah. be able to do that anyway was And this is impressive. an example of something she could do while in a trance state, yes. but not in her normal waking consciousness. Correct. Absolutely correct. Uh -huh. And uh, as far as I know, uh, the, the best explanation of this uh, talent is that it was some sort of latent creative ability. Well, there's certainly no evidence in the case that there was ever a personality of Patience Worth corresponding to um, the communicator Patience Worth. There's mm -hmm. no verifiable information in the case. So yeah. as a case of survival, it's actually very weak. As a case of dissociative creativity, it's very strong. Um, and that's important because it serves as a benchmark for looking at other comparable cases. Well, the other thing that complicates it is that there seems to be a lot of psi going on as well. Mm -hmm. Because how did she know about some of these rare Anglo-Saxon words that appeared in her uh, poetry and plays and novels, mm -hmm. which had to be tracked down by people who were experts in the field? So this is a person with an eighth grade education, no interest in uh, the subjects that she wrote about mm -hmm. in her uh, communicated novels yeah. and so on. Well, I have often thought, and, and I know I'm making some logical leaps here, that it doesn't much matter whether we say this is living agent psi uh, or clairvoyance or survival because psi itself implies that the human mind has the ability to reach out beyond the body, beyond the normal senses to acquire information. It uh, comes awful close to uh, the requirements for survival. Well, I hate to give my host some trouble, but yeah. um, the fact that it can reach out beyond the body doesn't mean it can survive beyond the body. Mm -hmm. So. I can't quite follow you on that inference. Well, I, and I appreciate that. I know I'm making a kind of logical leap there, but it it seems that if if I if my mind is capable of, <clears throat> of, of reaching out and gathering information from a thousand miles away that I can't uh, acquire through any normal means, uh, it it does suggest to me that. Uh, something incredible is going on either way. Well, I don't question that. Yeah. I think to get from that to survival, we need to introduce some other steps along the way. I, I like understand. Whether one yeah. needs to leave the body to get that information. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, and in fact, uh, 
uh, I know that uh, physicalists would say that the mind doesn't necessarily leave the body at all to acquire that information. It's the information somehow uh, gets to the body through some sort of unknown channel. Right. It just shows you how messy this whole area yeah. is. It, it is very messy, but I also feel, and I know we're in an obscure field, uh, it seems to me to be uh, incredibly both important and uh, valuable just to ask these questions. Well, certainly important. I mean, I think all of us would like to feel that uh, our lives don't end when the body dies, mm -hmm. that there might be some kind of continued existence. And even if not, it gives us insight as to who we are. Yes. Yes, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, very few of our viewers, I'm sure, are trans mediums, and, and yet by looking at uh, the history of trans mediums, 150 years of, of research, we can learn a lot about ourselves. Well, especially when you think that some of the people who turned out to be the great trans mediums didn't know until advanced stages in their life that they had these abilities. Mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Leonard found out she could be a medium only after an accident. Mrs. Piper found out only after visiting another medium at which, in whose presence she fell into a trance and started mm -hmm. uh, exhibiting the same characteristics. Well, I do find it fascinating that uh, mediumship was such a huge fad a uh, hundred years ago, 150 years ago, and now seems to be sort of almost uh, an, an antique uh, habit. Well, I don't know. I think it's uh, taken other forms in the popular media. We yeah. see it in TV shows and in movies. In a way, it may have just been integrated more thoroughly into uh, our way of looking at things. Perhaps so. Well, Stephen, our time is up once again. Thank you so much for this discussion. My pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.